Welcome back to Evolve Into Power, the podcast on a mission to highlight Central Florida's community and business leaders in hopes of sharing the lessons they've learned with you all to help you evolve into power. Today's episode, Max and Dr. Alicia Clarcius were joined by Tim McKinney, the CEO of United Global Outreach. UGO is a nonprofit organization that exists to positively transform forgotten communities into places in which we'd all want to live. This is Tim's story. We hope you enjoy. All right. So, hello, Tim. How are you? Doing great. How are you guys doing today? Wonderful, wonderful. And we just wanted to congratulate you on your many successes. We see that you're the CEO of the United Global Outreach, that you're on several boards, such as the Community Health Center, Central Florida Commission of the Homeless, Project Opioid, Homeless Service Network of Central Florida. You also received several awards, such as the NOVA Award, Roadmaps to Health Action Award, Hospital Charitable Services Award, Citizen of the Year, one of 50 Most Powerful People, which is a great award, uh, <laughs> a nonprofit CEO of the year, and just many more we see. Can you tell us a little bit about how you achieved all of those um, awards and how you got to the status that you are today? Sure, sure. Well, for one thing, I had to fail a whole lot to get to the <laughs> point I'm at. In fact, I, I often tell people sometimes you have to lose everything to get to the right place at the right time to do the right thing. So a little bit of background history on me. Uh, previous to uh, being in this line of work, uh, founding a nonprofit and working to try to create a model to actually solve poverty in our toughest neighborhoods, I used to be a success, pretty successful mortgage banker. In fact, for over 10 years, I had a limo and a chauffeur 24 seven and really lived a whole different lifestyle than I do today. And then uh, through a crazy set of circumstances, um, beginning with my great aunt about the time she turned 92 years old, the doctors gave her three months to live. And so I had a big house at the time on the golf course in East Orange County and she had no kids of her own and I invited her to move in with me so she wouldn't have to go to a nursing home because she had spent her whole life taking care of people until they passed. She had quit her job, in fact, when I was seven or eight to take care of my great-grandmother. She was a nurse at Florida Hospital and had spent her whole life taking care of other people. So I kind of wanted to pay that back to her. And then uh, about a, I say a manicure, a pedicure and a pacemaker, and she lived almost four more years. So, <laughs> that heroic at the time, a three month commitment turned into a four year life changing experience for me. And about a year into that three month commitment, the, the mortgage markets literally dried up overnight uh, and began what, what became known as the Great Recession. So she actually outlived all of my resources. And wow. at the end of the time of taking care of her, I was emotionally, spiritually, physically, and financially exhausted. And so I didn't really know what was going to be next for me in life. Uh, I was actually having a coffee with my best friend, Tony Calico, who's a uh, upstate New York Italian and uh, had been a missionary to the Roma uh, in Romania for the last 20 years. And, and, and he was, I, I was saying, Tony, you know, what, what can I do next? I just feel depleted and don't really have a direction in life now that Aunt Dorothy's passing. And um, he challenged me, he said, Tim, you know, every time I visit Or Orlando, you always tell me about your family moving here in the 20s and your grandma went to high school here and your dad went there. He said, why don't you find a neighborhood here that needs help and help them until you figure out what to do next? And really what he was saying as I look back on it was, why don't you stop focusing on your own problems and start investing in other people? And when that's you terrific. do those things, great things will happen. And so that's how I founded uh, United Global Outreach. And I went to a community that I'd never been in before, Bithlo in East Orange County, that had just suffered from 100 years of generational poverty. Mm -hmm. And... Honestly, after talking to residents and pastors and other people in the neighborhood, I realized that all of the problems in Bithlo were solvable problems. They were infrastructure and systems problems that, that no one was addressing. So right. I, I went to Starbucks in College Park and on the back of a Starbucks napkin wrote down several areas that needed to be at least evaluated that was making Edgewater or College Park a normal quote unquote healthy community that maybe we should assess in, in Bithlo. And, and then I recognized immediately those areas, education, transportation, housing, environmental issues, basic needs, which include social services, economic opportunity, the arts and athletics, uh, healthcare, all of these things, I had zero ability to solve because I didn't know anything about any of them. <laughs> 
But what made me pretty successful in the mortgage business and other things in life was I know how to build relationships. Right. And I, right. Nor. So we really have taken an entrepreneurial approach to this work and we've leveraged the experts that do know what they're doing and convinced them to come into the space around a common mission. And so I always chuckle at the 50 most powerful people recognition because I, I felt a lot more powerful when I had a lot of money and a lot of uh, resources, but influence really is more valuable than money. And we've mm -hmm. gained influence because we've actually been working and succeeding at solving what others thought was an unsolvable problem. Wow. And in this case, real people's lives depend on our success. So that's fantastic. That's fun. And the thing about it, Tim, uh, you, you're a man after my own heart. You know, I'm in the real estate business, so uh, we speak the same language. Let me ask you this. Um, I see that it is one of um, uh, UGO's um, mission is to cure generational wealth, which is a, a Herculean uh, task, if you will. Uh, you mentioned a couple of, uh, of sections that need to be curated, which is education, healthcare, basic needs, uh, social services. Tell us a little bit about that. What does the uh, education look like? How do you tackle that? And what is missing in that field that uh, you uh, with, with the foundation is addressing? Yeah, so what we've found is again, in, in our country, any kid, no matter what neighborhood they grew up in has access to public schools. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the public school system isn't working for every kid in every community. And so that was one of the first things really that we noticed is grandparents on down, a lot of folks had never gotten past the ninth grade. You know, why is that? I went to the Orange County Public Schools. Bithlow residents could go to Orange County Public Schools, but what was the disconnect? And sure. so as we drilled down that, we realized with all of the other things happening in kids' lives, the trauma that they face because of broken systems and broken homes, and then even things that maybe happened to them pre-birth that, that caused developmental issues or other sure. things to go wrong, the public school system's just not set up to be able to address mm -hmm. all of those needs. And then the second thing we noticed was, if we're gonna impact this community, we have to affect the toughest five or 10% in order to change the whole tone for the neighborhood. Sure. So in Bithlow, we really uh, started a private school called Orange County Academy not to be the anti-public school, because again, I went to Orange County Public Schools, my grandparents did, but sure. to how to figure out how can we connect and partner in a way that would allow kids in Bithlow to succeed where otherwise they weren't. So we have now seven, about 70 kids, kindergarten through 12th grade, and we have no class larger than 12, which again, the financial numbers don't work in the public school system, even with sure. that amount of funding, but we've, we've figured out how to drill down and just stay committed to that and create a space where kids could succeed in spite of whatever else might still be happening in the neighborhood while we're working on building those underlying systems like housing and clean drinking water and those other things. That's terrific. That's terrific. And so, what is, uh, go ahead. So just like him, you tugged at my heart with the healthcare part. So I just kind of want to hear a little bit about the healthcare side and what you guys are doing with that. Well, again, the second thing, honestly, you guys are asking questions almost in the order of revelation uh, for me when I was uh, first becoming a part of this community. And the second thing I noticed that what everybody was going to the emergency room and the nearest hospital right. was at the time Florida Hospital about uh, 12 miles away. But in that 12 square mile span, there was also no access to the bus because there was no public transportation at the time, mm -hmm. no sidewalks, no street lights, a dangerous bridge that you had to cross. So literally mm -hmm. thousands of people a year were going to the emergency room to access primary care. And most of them were taking the ambulance to get there. In wow. fact, if I knew then what I know now, I would have kept my limousine, leased it to Florida <laughs> hospital and <laughs> to the emergency room because when you're going by ambulance to the emergency room with your three kids, because it's the only way to get there for mm -hmm. strep throat, uh, pink eye, mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. things that should be addressed by the doctor, all of us are paying the bills uh, for that uh, inefficient right. way to access healthcare. So mm -hmm. I actually put a post on Facebook and I said, hey, if anybody's a doctor and to help me try to figure out how to solve the healthcare uh, access issue in Bitho, please reach out to me. And a guy named Pete Clark noticed that we went to the same high school. He sent me a message and said, I used to work for Orange County government. I know Bitho. 
and I'm working for this organization called Community Health Centers, and I'd love to come and talk to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, he actually, we sat down for a cup of coffee. We instantly clicked. He got the CEO of Community Health Centers to take a tour. And 10 months later, we had the, a primary health care clinic opening in Bithlow, defying all of the bureaucracy, because I later found out there was a process to open new clinics that should sure. take sure. a couple of years. So yeah. thankfully, nobody told me the, the slow road. We, we took the fast road of leveraging influence. And now I'm the immediate past board chair, but still serving on the board of the largest federally qualified health system in Central Florida, which is community health centers. Still. And just to update you, fast forward 10 years, where there was no access to the doctor, the dentist, the optometrist, the psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and the pharmacy, uh, we're, now, we're now breaking ground this month on a brand new $2.5 million permanent building. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. one, under one roof, we'll have four dental chairs, uh, six exam rooms, pharmacy, behavioral health, optometry. We'll actually have total continuity of care in Bithlo permanently mm -hmm. for generations to come where there was zero access. I love that. That's fantastic. So out of that. Yeah. Tim, uh, talk about some of the challenges. I know um, you mentioned what happened, I assume, back in 2007, 2008. Um, to some of the challenges that you're currently facing right now, obviously, you're making a lot of ground, uh, a lot of changing, changes happening in Biflo. Talk about some of the challenges that you experienced from the inception until where you are currently. Well, I think... I'll talk about the community challenges first. And if you want to ask personal challenges, I can get into that later. But Absolutely. community, I think, are faced by every low-income, uh, underserved community in the world. Is sure. that the powers that be out there could care less about what's happening here mm -hmm. unless you happen to be in the eyesight or the earshot of, of the powerful people that don't want to be bothered by issues of poverty. So sure. Bithlo had an extra tough situation because it's not urban. It's out on the edge of the county. It's a little bit off of the beaten paths, you know, separated by in half by a major highway. So really no one of importance, quote unquote, I say that loosely because I think sure. every person is important, but <laughs> important, people, important people didn't care about Bithlow. So one of the challenges right out of the gate was how do we help to elevate the importance of this important community and what we did was we went to the neighboring communities that were middle class, Avalon Park and Wedgefield, and we started speaking to Rotary and Kiwanis and churches and explaining the issues that just over the wall, if you will, or just over the fence or around the corner, the residents of Bithlo face. And when I talk about through no fault of your own, because there's no public water access and there's hundreds of acres of junkyards and illegal dumps and other things that your water may, may bust your teeth by the time you're in the eighth grade or when you turn on the sink, the water is orange from the high wow. iron and manganese. Wow. And I say to him, Avalon Park, would that be okay for your kid? And instantly every mom says, absolutely not. It's unacceptable. I wouldn't accept it. Then they then leverage their influence to the powers that be to say, hey, we're not okay with what we just found out our neighbors are dealing with. And then Advent Health now, formerly Florida Hospital, mm -hmm. as an organization said, hey, we want to, we care about um, communities like Bitho from a mission standpoint. And uh, we're, we're enlightened by what you've shared. And we've now pulled data and realized we're treating all of these folks through our emergency room, which is not the best way. Mm -hmm. And so as a, as a corporation, they said, we care about Bitho. So then suddenly the mayor, the county commission, the senators, the, the governors decided if Advent Health and Rotary and Kiwanis and these churches outside of Bithlow care about Bithlow, even if we don't really care about Bithlow, we got to care. Yeah. So we, we really found such a tidal wave of, of momentum around this on behalf of this community that now uh, I would dare say that it'd be hard to get elected to public office unless you come and take in a tour and recognize the opportunities that this community has. Would you say that uh, some of the challenges that you're seeing uh, uh, on a uh in Biflo is a, a global issue, not just here in Florida, but anywhere, everywhere in, in all our states. Would you say that uh, from your experience, that's also a challenge all around the country? Around the world. So as we've now started to duplicate this model of what, what's called community place-based population health, and we've actually started uh, in the last two years to host 
international fellows through the U.S. Department of State from uh, emerging countries and post-communist countries. And so we're working with those fellows in their communities in Haiti, two communities in Kenya, Slovakia, Albania, Romania, Albania, working on the same issues. Because what we find too often is we address, we get very reactionary. So if there's a shooting, we do a gun safety something. If there's illiteracy, we start an after-school program. What we fail to do too often is work on the underlying structural issues like housing and and public sanitation and water. And so, again, this model that digs deeper than just a program and works on fixing the underlying infrastructure while focusing on keeping the same people in the neighborhood, which by the way, worldwide doesn't usually happen. Jurisdictions, governments in particular get mm -hmm. quote fed up with neighborhoods sure. and end up bulldozing away, right. which chases out the people that they declare they're trying to help to another neighborhood, something's rebuilt and it's not the same people group. And so, yes, I yeah. think worldwide, the way yeah. we address poverty is a dramatic shift. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. Well so, said. I like how you are all over pretty much and that um, it helps with the name of the organization, United Global It Outreach. just makes sense because- It does uh, make sense. What um, this problem uh, that you're addressing here, Mr. K McKenney, is a, a global, global problem, issue, right? right. And, and, and you can see that in, in, in many places, right? And I'm sure, like you said, the powers that be, some of those communities like Biflo, uh, funding dollars are not, mm -hmm. you know, are not necessarily, they're not the first priority, if you will. Uh, monies are being invested in more affluent neighborhoods to help them grow and develop. Uh, so uh, you're, you're certainly doing, a, a, you know, a, the work that, that's necessary for some of these communities. Again, um, tell us about the, um, I see that you, you're, you're, you're yielding quite a bit of, uh, of uh, connections. Tell us about some of the people that are connected and ultimately, if someone wants to get connected with the project, they wanna be mm -hmm. in touch with you, how can they get involved as well? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I'd like to reach out to hopefully your core audience, which is entrepreneurs. So even in the real estate world and the, and the legal profession, again, it's, it's going to take entrepreneurs to solve community issues like this because we realize that government and nonprofit social service mm -hmm. agencies have not succeeded. Because mm -hmm. again, we need innovative solutions to very complex public problems and we need to be working on them one neighborhood at a time, which again is our model. Instead of just broadly saying we want to solve poverty, well, how will we ever know <laughs> if we need it unless we can do it in one neighborhood like the Bithlow community? So whatever your background, if you're watching this podcast right now, whatever your expertise, I can promise you it's needed to be leveraged in communities like Bithlow. And you can give back using your skill set strategically with a common mission uh, and, and having others joining arms to actually stay in the fight, if you will, until neighborhoods are transformed. So if folks wanted to reach out to me, I mean, I'd love to work uh, in some areas in your community and, and come alongside you guys and help you understand some of the successes that we've had here. Again, because what are we trying to do? We're all trying to work together so that every person has an equal opportunity to succeed. And if you don't have clean drinking water and if you don't have safe housing and if you don't have access to the doctor in your neighborhood, then the very place that you're born could determine your likelihood to succeed or fail. In fact, my single mom raised my little brother and I just 20 miles west of here. And every day I wonder what would our lives have been like if we'd just been born 20 miles east. Right. Mm. And through both of our own, our whole destinies would have been reset. If for no other reason than maybe my teeth would have been busted because of the <laughs> water quality right. of the drink. Sure. Without a great smile, you guys, you got pretty amazing smiles. Without a <laughs> great you. smile, you probably wouldn't be sitting in the chair you're sitting in right. because of that very, that, that single issue. Sure. Um, which, again, it's just not fair. Yeah, it, make, it makes sense. It makes sense. Well, so thank you for the, the work that you're doing. Yes, truly. So for the kids that want to follow down your path or even the entrepreneurs, what would you tell them? Or what would you tell them from the um, person that you used to be, you know, the younger um, Timothy McKinney versus the one that you are today? Well, I'd say number one, it's important to stay mission, not money focused. So again, I think again, what made me fairly successful in the mortgage banking business was, 
I never did a loan for someone that I wouldn't want done for myself if I had their same circumstances. And so that made getting referrals so much easier because people wanted to refer. Absolutely. I wasn't just trying to stick it to a person and then get more people and more people. And so taking that philosophy over to the work we're doing now in life, if we'll stay mission focused and not money focused and, mm -hmm. and try to help everybody have the same opportunity to succeed that I've had, then I think the money will follow. Absolutely. Will follow. Even I myself, when I, when I think of a commission, again, you see the word mission in there, right? Providing a service, uh, giving, I, I believe it's Jim Ron who says, if you help enough people get what they want, you will get what you want, right? And, and, and that's, that's, that's terrific, Mr. McKinney. Let me ask you this. Um, what are some of the things that uh, uh, people can, that are listening, how do they educate themselves on some of, some of the issues that you brought here? So that way we can begin to prep ourselves uh, and get our hands uh, uh, e equipped and ready to assist with some of this, uh, this task that's ahead of us here. So what you have to do is get out there and see it and experience it for yourself. So nobody comes to Bithlo uh, by accident. You have to intentionally come here because it's not on the way to other things. And so <laughs> when I came out here myself in person and became aware of the issues, seeing for myself an illegal dump that has been here 30 years in the neighborhood and so forth. So we've just taken that and translated it to other folks. So I get what the Orlando Sentinel calls notorious Bithlo tours where we drive around in my pickup truck and we see all of the, not only negative things that are happening in the neighborhood, but all the opportunities of what could happen here. And then folks can realize, wow, I had no idea because too often we are able to live in our neighborhood and things just seem to be great and unless we experience what's not working right in other neighborhoods, even good people are oblivious, if you sure. will. So sure. what I would say to every person is if you have a desire to help, uh, don't show up at just Christmas and Easter and don't just show up with a bag of groceries. Come into <laughs> neighborhoods and build real relationships. You know, sit down and have a meal with people, have a cup of coffee and really make a personal connection and I say that would translate into our political climate today. It's pretty easy to hate people that we don't know. Sure. So when we can yell at each other behind keyboards and across right. the sidewalks, <laughs> but if we actually sit down with each other and get to know each other, then I think we'll find there's more we have in common than, than we have different. Mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I think we would say, I only want for the kids in Bitho what I, what, what I would want for my own kids. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We will all build a house in Bitho that I wouldn't want to live in myself. Absolutely. And I think that kind of a standard that other people can apply in communities and we can get out of the habit of just treating the symptoms of poverty and actually work to solve poverty in tough neighborhoods. Absolutely. And the model that you guys are working there in um, Bifflo, is it at the point where it's being tried elsewhere, uh, say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in other cities in other states? Yeah, so just like I kind of touched on earlier, we've been invited to host international fellows through our U.S. Department of State. And so I spent the whole month of October in Roma uh, villages, which are gypsy yeah. villages in, in Europe that are, again, very outcast communities and helping to work on helping our fellows who are already doing incredible work in their country understand sure. that it can't just be, we can't just address one thing and have a transformed community. We have to address all of the systems wow. simultaneously. Or I'll take education, for example. James, my fellow from Haiti that I can't wait to get back and visit again. I was just there at the end of February before we got all locked down. But James is, was one of 8,000 applicants worldwide for this fellowship that had 70 accepted. So this guy's already cream of the crop, doing amazing work. But he's working on education. And I had to tell, remind James that an educated population might leave and right. never back to the neighborhood. Right. So right. we can't just work on education because those kids have to have a house to grow up and live in and Makes all sense. of the infrastructure. So James is now, again, not stopping what he was doing, but he's now working more globally in his neighborhood and leveraging those resources. So, so yes, we're working through coaching and really on the ground hands-on help to duplicate this model. That's why I opened the invitation to uh, you guys and you, the Tevas neighborhood you know of. Let's work there and try to see if we can bring about real 
generational change and not accidentally right. displace the people that we're trying to help. Right. And I love that generational change because yeah. uh, not just helping this current population, but making sure that, uh, let's just say for lack of a better word, the disease of poverty is eradicated and that same knowledge, wisdom and understanding can be passed on to the next generation, generation and so on. Uh, it's fantastic. Well, your, your mindset, uh, your standard that's acceptable just gets lower because it's never been better. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you accept a lower bar that then you ought to have accepted for yourself. And, and we as volunteers have to work, think a little bit differently too, because, you know, we, we have these big uh, volunteer days. You guys might have it at your organization. We all wear matching t-shirts. We go pack, you know, thousands right. of meals to send the kids we'll never meet. We take a group photo, right. put it on social media. That's and right. We, they feel like we've saved the world. And then we go back to our neighborhood. That's right. right. That's right. System change is a many year process and we have to like stay on it like a, mm -hmm. like a dog on a bone. We can't give up. We have to keep working hard because real people's lives depend on our success. That's right. That's right. Wow. That, that's, that's terrific. And again, we, we certainly want to congratulate you on the work that you're doing. Uh, <clears throat> And, and, and the change that's happening in the community. Tell us about the, uh, I believe you said 70 or so people that are part of the program. Tell us a little bit about the transformation that you're seeing in their lives. So we have about 70 partners, but maybe more that have joined this initiative. And then in our private school, Orange County Academy, which again, is not designed to, to take every kid in Bithlewin, but to really help kids that otherwise would have a tough uh, chance of succeeding in public school not because they're not incredibly bright by the way we are our most recent graduates uh just completing a year at rollins college you know and so wow. we have incredibly bright students doing incredibly amazing things but again you know i'll just bring it back to a graduation a couple years ago with that student that now that went on to rollins we have all of our students in the school go to the graduation and i remember a four-year-old grandpa coming up to me kind of tearing eyed because Aww. his little granddaughter in kindergarten came up to him and said papa i want to be a doctor and he was crying because he said you know tim i actually think she can be wow. but again if you've never met a doctor how can you aspire to be a doctor right 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 i love that that's amazing and relationships and exposing people to to opportunities that they never thought were possible, then people just on their own, they don't need a program. They just right. need a relationship to succeed. That's so, fantastic. I'm gonna take us back and tell us how you really got started into this. Is there someone that really influenced you besides your grandmother as well from you taking care of her? Or well, you, like three my people? Great aunt me, my, my great aunt helped me to get focused in this work and the way that we're doing with United Global Outreach. But I have to go back to both of my parents who, admittedly would say we were not perfect role models. I grew up in a home that my parents got divorced when I was seven and my dad was an alcoholic until he died. But my dad had a work ethic that, you know, you work and get the job done. But, and my mom always was a generous person giving back to others and neither one of them equated their time with money. So they never said, we're going to do X as long as we get paid for it. So they were always volunteering little league and helping other people and, and, and so I think that mindset of service was, yeah. I, I can attribute to my parents, the, the giving and generous generosity of my mom, the selflessness from my mom and from my dad, that really uh, um, tenacious personality that said, if you get hurt, you know, he was my baseball coach, you know, I had a broken kneecap for a couple of days before I finally said I needed to go to the doctor because <laughs> I just wanted to take it off and take it off and keep playing, and keep you know going. what I mean? And, right. I think, and I think we need that mentality today because too mm -hmm. often we hit a wall and instead of breaking through it to get to where we need to be, we just go the long way or we mm -hmm. turn around. And so I have to credit my parents uh, both for giving me the, the personality that it really has taken to work in this tough neighborhood um, and really help to advocate on behalf of some really amazing people that had been ignored and overlooked for too long. And uh, uh, talk a little bit about STEM and, uh, uh, you know, to the, to the listeners, Tim, on um, people often think they can control time 
if something is not happening in six months or in a year or two years, they often want to give up. Uh, you mm-hmm. mentioned the tenacity of your father and, and being able to struggle through it. And I'm sure the, the type of work that you're doing, uh, there are some days that it, it, you might want to throw your hands in the air. Tell us mm-hmm. a, a little bit about that and what keeps you pushing through that struggle. Well, I mean, just last Thursday, two uh, men and a woman were shot and killed, you know, three blocks from our school. You know, the mm-hmm. deputy showed up at a car that had crashed on Colonial Drive, and uh, as it was reported, the car was bullet riddled. You know, those were real people who had real families, even though they had some serious addiction issues and they were at the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the dad, for example, his four kids started our school yesterday. Wow. Why? Why, are we, why do I do what I do every day? Because real people's lives depend on our success. So again, it goes back to staying mission focused. And then when we talk about time, things never happen as fast as I'd like them to because I want to push things along faster than they should go. Sure. Um, but that's really the beauty of what we've learned here. Um, you can make things happen faster if you get the right people that have the right influence and the right relationships and the right authority to believe in what you're doing, then the timeline can be sped up considerably. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, um, There was a very dangerous bridge on the way to quote town, wasn't in Bithlow proper, but it's a few miles from here that people had to cross every day to get to work. There was nowhere to walk or ride your bike for 200 feet. Um, That seemed like an impossible thing to solve because it's just one bridge in a region that has a lot of transportation issues going on by a community that nobody cared about. And then lo and behold, I get a call from Congressman John Micah's office one day and they wanted to take a tour, heard about the work that we were doing, redistricting, had him coming mm-hmm. into the edge of Bithlow. And I didn't know Congressman Micah, but I find out he's the chair of the Transportation Committee in the House of Representatives. Fantastic. So when he, takes, when he takes the tour, he asked me, uh, you know, what do I need to see? I pull my pickup truck next to the bridge, we get out, I say, Congressman Micah, let's walk across this bridge that residents have to walk across every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, We get about eight steps onto the bridge. A semi truck comes about a half an inch from his head. And what's going on over there took a power shift from the wind gust and back again. And he turned around and said, McKinney, you made your damn point. Let's get off of this bridge. (laughs) And immediately, immediately he picked up his phone, he called the Secretary of Transportation for the state of Florida and said, Secretary, you need to fly down and tour this bridge with me. A couple of weeks later, the Secretary from, of Transportation for the state of Florida is touring the bridge with Congressman Micah. And all of a sudden, this bridge that was 20 years away from being evaluated was moved to the top of the priority list and a brand new wow. $15 dollar bridge sits there. So again, we can, we can speed up time if yeah. we get people committed to the right, right. mission right. and we get the right people involved. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So kind of tell our, our listeners too, what um, online connections um, are they able to look up? Like so your social sites, basically, how can they? Yeah. So, you know, personally, uh, if they want to follow my antics, cause I do leverage social media pretty effectively. And a lot of the things that we've gotten done, they can look me up on Instagram at T I M U G O one. And then on uh, Facebook, it's Timothy McKinney. And, uh, you know, I try to mix again, nobody wants to hear everybody complaining all the time. And so we're (laughs) always solution driven, but we're also not afraid to call out a powerful person if they become aware of the situation and they refuse to, to be a part of solving the problem. And again, if it was just Tim McKinney, we'd have zero accomplished out here. But now there's that, this whole, uh, army of folks that now care about communities like Bithlow. And so literally 10,000 people have come here in the last five years to volunteer and groups have come from 32 states to be here. And so all of that is leveraged uh, in, in, in growing elements through our social media. So I'd love to have people join us. That's fantastic. Is there anything else that um, you want to add that, you know, for the viewers or the listeners? No, I just appreciate you guys uh, using your platform to draw attention to this community that has so much promise and so much hope and so many terrific people living here that again, all that folks from Bitho really desire is the same thing that we've enjoyed in our life, an equal opportunity to succeed. Right. So once we 
have that, we got to make it on our own as individuals. And, you know, I can't transform a life and neither can you. But again, if we all have the same foundation, then we have the same opportunity here in this great country. So thank you. Thank you so much thank for you. being here, uh, Tim. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing uh, yeah. in the community. If just from speaking to you, you certainly are community centric and in, 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 in making a difference. Uh, for those that are listening, please uh, reach out to McKinney on his sites. We'll highlight that in the shows here. Mm -hmm. However, you can support. Uh, please come alongside of the this important work that he's doing in Biflo and with the potential to do community. elsewhere. Right. Mr. McKenney, right. thank you so much for being here with us today. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.